when something is done in secret, there's usually something to hide. Hi guys, Christian here. You just heard from G. Edward Griffin, author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. I just finished the book, and if you haven't read it yet, you must get a copy right now. I'll leave a link in the description down below. The Federal Reserve is a monster, and it is not the first time a central bank was created in the United States, but it's the fourth iteration of this demon that does so much incredible harm. We'll jump right into this interview with the author, but before we do, please make sure to smash that like button. Now let's learn more on how we can end the Fed. The Federal Reserve System is a strange creature. It's easier to say what it is not than what it is. Uh, Most people think it's a government agency. It is not. Uh, Those who have studied it say, well, wait a minute, this is a private banking corporation. You almost get half credit for that, but it's not really a private corporation either. It's a hybrid. And to make it more complicated, we can say it is a cartel. This is the amazing thing. The Federal Reserve System is a banking cartel. Uh, It's no different than a banana cartel or an oil cartel or the sugar cartel. It just happens to be a banking cartel. It's a group of very large and powerful private banking interests who have gotten together in a cartel arrangement and they brought the federal government into it as a partner in order to use the force of law to enforce the, the cartel agreement. You see, with most cartels, uh, if a member of the cartel wants to break out or violate the agreement, if they fixed prices, for example, and one of the members of the cartel wants to raise the prices contrary to the agreement, there's no way for them to, to discipline the member of the cartel and force him to stick with the agreement. But if you bring the government into the arrangement and convert the agreement into law, now all members are required by law to keep the agreement or they go to jail. So this is why cartels always throughout history have always tried to form a partnership with the government, whatever government is in the locale where they operate. And so we come to the amazing conclusion that the Federal Reserve System is basically a cartel, a banking cartel, that has gone into partnership with the federal government of the United States so that the federal laws can be used to enforce the cartel agreement. Now that's a real shock. It was to me because, you know, when I started in this mm, process of research, I thought, like most people, that the Federal Reserve was an agency of the government and that it was formed to protect the people, to protect you and to protect me and to stabilize the economy and to uh, make sure that we didn't have much inflation or unemployment or all these bad things. And you know, when the chairman of the Federal Reserve comes before Congress or before the television cameras and he's asked to explain why they raised the interest rates this month or why they lowered them or whatever they did, the chairman always says, well, we did it for you folks. We did it in order to cool down the economy or to stimulate the economy or to to create more jobs or whatever. It's always expressed in terms of, we did it for you folks. It wouldn't go too well if they said, well, we really did it because it helped the banks. Uh, People would say, what? What did he say? You know, but you can imagine uh, the head of the banana cartel saying, well, why did you raise the price of bananas this month? Well, we did it for you folks to to make sure that... um, uh, that there would be enough stimulus in the economy that we would always have bananas, you see. Anyway, back to the question. What is the Federal Reserve System? It is a cartel, and it's a hybrid organization. There are very few like it in existence. It seems to have some of the characteristics of a government agency because the government is involved, and it seems to have some characteristics of a private corporation because it's actually owned by private banks. But it's neither of the two. It's a hybrid. And when it comes to ownership, for example, the member banks actually own the Federal Reserve System. But those certificates of ownership do not carry the usual prerogatives of ownership. For example, the banks can't sell the shares. If you can't sell something, you don't really own it. And they can't even vote for their board of directors, you see. So what's this ownership business? It's merely a kind of a a facade. It's, it's a name. It's a word they give to it. Well, it's owned by the banks, but in reality, it is really a hybrid. It's a cartel that operates under the protection of the federal government, and the government has given it a monopoly, a virtual monopoly, to create the nation's money supply. Now, I have no doubt 
that the members of the Federal Reserve System, the, the banking cartel, want to see the economy as, as uh, strong as possible. They don't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. But you can be sure that when there is a conflict between the, uh, uh, the advantage of the cartel or the purposes of the nation at large, there has to be no choice. They always go for the purpose of the, of the cartel because that is who they are. That is who employs them. That's where their money comes from. That's the reason for being. Now, the purpose of the Federal Reserve System really is to protect the large member banks from competition and to preserve their profit margins. And as we've seen in late, uh, when some of the banks get into trouble, the purpose of the Federal Reserve System comes to the fore, which is to pass on the losses of the banks to the taxpayers. They do this uh, through Congress, generally. Remember, Congress is a partner with the Federal Reserve System. And they go to Congress and they say, well, the banks are in trouble. Now, we don't want the banks to fold because that would be bad for the economy, right? That would be bad for you folks. And so, since it's for you folks that we're doing this, the congressmen kick in the extra money to bail out the banks, to guarantee the loans, to guarantee the interest payments from the countries that are going bankrupt and can't make their interest payments to the bank and so forth, whether it's Mexico or China or Russia or some country in Africa or Asia. They cannot pay. They cannot pay. So they come to Congress. Congress says, we'll pay for them. And it seems like it's a humanitarian thing when in reality, all they're doing is transferring tax dollars from you and from me to these countries so they can continue to make interest payments to the banks so the banks don't um, have to write off these loans as bad loans. So that's another purpose of the Federal Reserve System is to pass off the losses of, of the cartel members to the taxpayers. And most people don't realize that, but when you see how it has operated over the years, it's very clear. The purpose of the Federal Reserve System is to promote the best interests of the banking members of the cartel. So what we have here is a banking cartel which has gone into partnership with the federal government and they've used this cozy relationship so that the government has given the banks the power to create the nation's money supply. The banks now, these private banks, have the monopoly over the nation's money supply. And that's not too shabby a deal. When I first became interested in the topic of the Federal Reserve System, I was aware that the Fed was formed not in Washington, D.C., not in the halls of Congress or some meeting room, but it was formed on a private island off the coast of Georgia called Jekyll Island. That's the reason I called my book The Creature from Jekyll Island, because here it was a strange thing that something as important as the Federal Reserve System was created on a private island off the coast of Georgia. That aroused my curiosity. I didn't think too much about it until I got into the details of the history. And what I found was absolutely amazing. First of all, this island in those days was privately owned. It was a resort island. It was a club. They called the Jekyll Island Club. And its members were a relatively small group of billionaires from New York, people like J.P. Morgan and William Rockefeller and their business associates and their families. And they went there during the cold winter months because uh, they wanted to get, get away from the, the ice and snow from New York. And so Jekyll Island in those days was a private uh, resort and they had a beautiful clubhouse there. In fact, it's still standing for anybody who wants to go there and visit it. The island has been preserved in many of these cottages, which they called them in those days, which were the summer resort uh, homes of the very wealthy, are still there and you can visit them and it's quite an example of the elegance and opulence of the turn of the century. But the key feature is the clubhouse. And the clubhouse is where this meeting took place. And I thought, isn't that strange? And I got into it and I discovered that not only did they go to this island for the meeting, but they went under conditions of great secrecy. I can assure you that the very few wars of history have ever been plotted under conditions of greater secrecy than that. For example, when they went to the island, they all traveled aboard the private railroad car of Senator Nelson Aldridge. 
He sent his railroad car to the New Jersey Railroad Station. This was November of 1910. And he and six other men, who I'll describe in a moment, arrived under conditions uh, that they were told they mustn't be seen together. They couldn't come together. They couldn't dine together on that evening. And they must avoid newspaper reporters at all costs because in those days, newspaper reporters used to hang out at the New Jersey Railroad Station because it was a way to, to catch photographs or interviews of famous people coming in and out of New York. And they were told to avoid uh, newspaper reporters. One of them carried a shotgun in a big black case. Just in case he had been confronted by a reporter, he was prepared to tell them that he was going on a duck hunting trip. And the funny thing about that is that we learn later from his children and his biographers that this man never owned a gun. He had borrowed that shotgun just as a decoy, as part of the deception. When they got on board this railroad car, they were told, even in the privacy of this car, not to address each other by last names, first names only. And two of them even went further and refused to address each other by first names. They adopted code names. And thought, well, that seems strange, even in the privacy of Senator Aldrich's car. Well, it turned out that uh, one of the men wrote about it in later years, and he said the reason for that is that they were concerned that the identities of all of these seven men might be known to the servants on board the car, and that the servants might talk about it. And in that fashion, the word would get out, and then, of course, the purpose of the meeting would have been uh, defeated in their opinions. And so this is the kind of secrecy that surrounded that. Even when they got to, to, um, to the island and then they got off the train and took the ferry across the inland straits there and went to the clubhouse, they had replaced all of the normal servants with new servants who didn't know any of these people. This is the kind of precautions that went on. And they created the Federal Reserve under those kinds of um, conditions of secrecy. And then when they came back, uh, back to New York and disappeared back into the environs of uh, Wall Street, uh, for quite a while thereafter, uh, uh, these men denied that such a meeting ever took place. They said, oh, no, that's just pure rumor. That's uh, nonsense. Later, it began to leak out. And they said, yes, we went to the meeting, but we just went to, to do some hunting and uh, play some poker and drink some good whiskey, that kind of thing, you know. Finally, after the Federal Reserve System was firmly established and became accepted and almost revered in the eyes of Americans as a great American institution, then they finally began to talk about this meeting, who was there, how they went, and why the secrecy. And it, most of this is now written in their memoirs or in their biographies or in interviews they gave with newspaper reporters and that sort of thing. So that if you go to any well-stocked library today, you can learn in minute detail exactly what happened on Jekyll Island, why they went, who these people were, and especially you will learn why the secrecy. Now, what is the reason for the secrecy? In those days, there was a great deal of concern among the American people about the concentration of financial power in the hands of a few uh, very wealthy and um, powerful financial interests in Wall Street. Um, they called this the money trust in those days. If you look into the uh, editorials of the time, you'll often find editorials condemning uh, the money trust. And uh, the cry in those days was to break the grip of the money trust. And one of the primary purposes of the Federal Reserve Act, as it was promoted to the American people, was just that, to break the grip of the money trust. They were going to write a law that was going to take the power away from these people and put it in the hands of their trustworthy politicians, you see. Put it in the hands of the people through the electoral process. That was the propaganda behind the Federal Reserve System. So what's the purpose of the secrecy? It's because when you look at the list of these people who went, they were the money trust. They were the representatives of the banks, of J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers. They represented Kuhn Loeb and Company. They had uh, connections, business relations with the Warburgs in Germany and the Netherlands and the Rothschilds in England. This was the money trust, not only of the United States, but of the world. 
These are the people who created the Federal Reserve System supposedly to break the grip of their own power. You see. So now, had that fact been known, who these people were that were drafting the Federal Reserve System, the, the trick would have been exposed and the public never would have adopted the Federal Reserve Act as in fact they did. Money is created through a process that I call the Mandrake Mechanism. Now that goes back to the 1940s when there was a popular comic book character by the name of Mandrake the Magician. He was quite a guy, he had this big black cape and he could wave it around and, and things would uh, disappear and then he'd wave it again and they would reappear. He was quite a magician. And I got to thinking about how money comes into being and how it's extinguished in the United States and much of the rest of the world for that matter. I thought, aha, that's the Mandrake me mechanism. It's magic is what it is. And it really is. It's uh, accounting magic. Here's how it works. Now I'm going to make this very simple, but uh, technically it's totally accurate. Um, it starts with Congress. Remember a moment ago I said that the Federal Reserve System was a, um, a partnership between a cartel and the federal government. Well, if there's a partnership, there's a reason for the partners, both of them, to be in it or they wouldn't be. So the question is why is why is the banking fraternity in this partnership and why are the politicians in it? And, and that is answered by understanding how money it comes into being. So it starts with Congress or the government side of the partnership. Congress needs more money. They always need more money. They, uh, they like to spend money. That gets them elected. Uh, they don't like to raise taxes because that gets them unelected. So congressmen and senators are always balancing this um, choice between how do we give more benefits, how do we buy more votes with the taxpayer's money without raising their taxes. And it's a perennial problem and the politicians get pretty good at, at this mechanism. The answer, of course, is that they borrow it. If you're not going to tax it from somebody, you can borrow it from somebody else. That sounds well and good and that's why we have government bonds and treasury notes and bills and so forth and we have what's called the national debt because they've borrowed money to pay for current expenses that they don't want to pay for through taxes because that would be unpopular. Well, fine as far as it goes but when you borrow money eventually you have to pay it back. See? So 30 days after they borrowed a billion dollars or 60 days, whatever the term of the loan is, or a year, they have to pay that money back. Well, lo and behold, it turns out that the congressmen and the senators are still not taking in as much money in taxes as they are spending in benefits. So they don't have the money to repay the loan. So what do they do? Easy. Borrow some more. Borrow enough to pay back the original loan plus a little bit more to keep them in office. Keep them uh, with the image of the big spenders. So this process goes on and on and on and that's why we have the national debt growing and growing and growing. So far so good. If you borrow money from somebody who has the money, you don't really increase the money supply. All you're doing is just taking it from one person and promising to pay back interest on it. But the money supply doesn't increase. The Federal Reserve enters the picture at this stage because you see they can never borrow enough from the private sector. There's never enough existing money out there for the politicians to borrow without having to raise the interest rate very, very high to attract it, which is also politically unpopular. So they don't want to do that either. So what do they do? They go to the Federal Reserve System and by agreement, remember this is their partner now in this agreement, the Federal Reserve System agrees literally to create the money that they're going to lend to the government. It's not really a lending at all, as you can see, but they, they use the old traditional words of lending it to the government, when in fact all they're doing is just printing it for the government. They're creating it for the government, and then they call it a loan. Of course, they don't print it all because most of it's checkbook money, but nevertheless, the process is the same as if they had just turned on the printing presses and printed all this money and gave it to the federal government and then they were going to loan it to the federal government and charge the government an interest on it and that's a misnomer either. What they should really say is we've created it for the federal government and now we want um, a service charge.
That's, that's an accurate understanding of what is really going on. But instead, they confuse it by saying that it's a loan and interest. So now, once the Federal Reserve System creates this money out of nothing, literally, it's fresh money into the society, into the economy, and that's how the money supply keeps growing and growing and growing. Now, that's just the beginning, though. Now, most people are alarmed when they hear about the fact that the Fed can create money out of nothing and charge interest on it, so-called interest. But that's just the beginning of the story. Let's uh, follow that money and see where it goes. Remember, there's another partner in this thing. We've only looked at the, at the government partner. What about the banking partner? What's in it for them? So let's follow the money and find out. Let's say, for example, that um, our post... Uh, our, our postal delivery guy gets a $1,000 check from the federal government. Now, that's money that was created out of nothing by the Federal Reserve System. He doesn't know that. To him, it's perfectly good. It's a check. It's a government check. He can spend it. So he takes it down to his private bank, his commercial bank, and he deposits it into his private checking account. Now the money suddenly is out of the government cycle of the government side of this and into the commercial banking side of it. Now this is where the action really heats up. If I were a banker and you were the the uh, postal delivery man and you came into my bank with your thousand dollar check and you deposited it into my bank into your account, I could go to the front of the bank and address everybody in the room there. And I can say, attention, everybody, uh, this fine gentleman here has just deposited $1,000 into our venerable bank. And now we have money to loan. And everybody would be happy because they know that many of them are there to borrow money. And they know that the more money there is to loan, that usually means the lower the interest rates are. So they're all happy. So some fellow over here says, well, how much did he deposit? And I said, well, $1,000. And he might say, well, that's not enough. I want to borrow 9000 because I'm looking at this uh, used car over here, and I need to borrow 9000 but you've only got 1000 I would then say, uh, don't worry about it, sir. I can lend you $9,000. And he would say, oh, where did the other eight come from? And I would have to say, don't worry about it, sir. Uh, these things are more complicated than you can imagine, and you don't need to know these things. I can lend you the $9,000, and in fact, I can if I'm a banker. For every dollar or every billion dollars that's put into uh, the banks through the circle we just talked about, I, as a commercial banker, banker, can create an additional $9 billion and push them out into the economy as loans. Now, that $9 billion based on the $1 billion, which itself was created out of nothing, that was the foundation. That was the one that they gave to the government, that billion. Now that nine billion comes into the commercial banks and the banks now can create an additional nine billion on top of the one billion. All of it is just fiat money. It's created out of nothing, but the commercial banks get the bigger end of the deal, as you can see. They can create nine for the private sector called loans, and these are genuine loans. And that is where our money comes from. That is how money is created. Every bit of it is created in this fashion. If we were to take away all of the loans, if all of the loans in the world would be repaid, there wouldn't be one red penny in circulation in the United States of America. It would all disappear back into the computer chips and into the vaults. There would be no money in circulation. Every bit of it is based upon debt, and that debt creates money that literally has nothing behind it at all. Now this is how money is created in the Western world. And it's an amazing story, and only a few people, even within the banking industry, really understand it. I've talked to many people who work in the banks, and they, they read my book and they say, gee, I didn't know that. All they know is how to keep the numbers balanced in the columns and how to fill out the application for loans. They all have a job to do. Only a very few people at the top know how money really comes into existence. The creation of money out of nothing has had a devastating impact on the purchasing power of the American dollar. I might add, 
this is this process is happening to all currencies in the world that adopt this process, and that's most of them in the Western world. Uh, so what I'm saying about the American dollar also applies to most currencies in the world, which have the ability to create money out of nothing, which they've given to their central banks. When you give men the power to create money out of nothing, you shouldn't be surprised if they turn around and create money out of nothing, because that's what they're supposed to do. Now, the underlying philosophy is that, well, we'll be very conservative about it. We won't run rampant. We won't abuse this power, would we? for our own personal gain or our political advantage. Heavens no, we would never do that. We are, we are wise and wonderful people and you can trust us, they say. So we give them blindly this power to create money out of nothing because we trust them to use this power wisely. Nowhere in history has this ever been a justified trust. Every time man has had that power, and this started back in antiquity, those with the power have abused it and they have created more and more and more money at a rate much faster than the expansion of goods and services which are being produced by the productive side of the economy. Now, if the goods and services were growing at a rate which is exactly the same as the money supply, then the purchasing power of the monetary unit would remain constant. And in fact, it has happened that way wherever men have not had the power to create money out of nothing. For example, when money was based on monetary units like gold or silver, it's interesting, I think, to know that in ancient Rome, if you had a one ounce gold coin, that would be the cost of a nice toga, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of sandals. Today, thousands of years later, if you have a one ounce gold coin, with no numismatic or collector's value to it, just a cougaran or, or a bullion coin of some kind. And you convert that into Federal Reserve notes. You can walk into a store and buy a nice suit, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of shoes. The real price of those items, and all items for that matter, throughout history does not change when measured in terms of something of intrinsic value, such as gold or silver, because those things take human effort to produce as well as the, the belt, the toga, and the sandals. Both of them take human effort to produce, and that's why they maintain uh, value with each other. But once you break that away, and you give men the power to, to expand the money supply without that discipline, they're going to expand the money supply faster than the increase in goods and services, and then you're going to have this uh, difference in purchasing power. We call it inflation. And uh, inflation, I think, is a bad word because really we think of inflation as rising prices. But in reality, what's happening, prices are not going up. It's that the value of the dollar or the monetary unit is going down. That's what's really happening if we understand the process. And it's a tax, therefore. Our lost purchasing power, the what we have to pay more for a bag of groceries today than we did five years ago, comes out of our pocket, comes out of our earning capacity. That is value which we should have, but it's been taken from us through a process that we call inflation, but in reality it's a hidden tax. It's a tax that is more vicious than any other tax you can imagine. There are no exemptions, no deductions. And those with the least amount of money pay it to the highest degree. I mean, it's the most unfair, most unjust tax you can imagine. And that is what inflation is. Inflation is the result of being able to create money out of nothing. And that is the power we have given to the Federal Reserve System. Therefore, we can say that the, in, the Federal Reserve System is the agency of a hidden tax called inflation. I feel that our paper currency must eventually be backed by gold or silver if we are to, to have an economy that will protect the purchasing power of the common man. We must have it furthermore to protect our freedoms because if we lose our economy, if we become totally dependent economically upon the state, 
then we've lost our freedom. We become vassals of the state. And all of this can be traced back to the fact that our monetary unit is completely valueless, or let's say it is valued only at the whim of our leaders. And that is a very precarious position to be in. I don't think anybody, if they thought it through, would ever say, that's the system I want, and yet that's the system we have. Congress receives its funding from various sources. Obviously, we think of taxes right away, and there's no question that taxes are a major source of funding. However, we know that Congress does not need income taxes at all, or any other kind of taxes for that matter, to fund its operation as long as it has the ability to collect this hidden tax called inflation. If it if it were to stop all taxes whatsoever, it could still continue to spend exactly as it is doing simply by inflating the currency a little more than it has been in the past. Isn't that an amazing thing? Congress does not need taxes, and yet they talk constantly about taxes. They want us to focus on the taxes because this we can measure. We fill out the form at the, each, at the end of each year with a geo is a 30% or a 40 or a 50% bite. And we can see the tax bill on our sales receipt, what we paid to the state, and we can look at those numbers and we complain about them. But the bigger menace is this hidden tax called inflation. We never see those numbers except that somehow at the end of the year we worked like dogs and we got a little bit of a raise, but our standard of living went down. And that's the tax I'm talking about. This is where Congress gets a great deal of its money, if not most of it, and where I think it plans to get most of it in the future. The solution to the problem of fiat money is to stop it, to eliminate it. We must get rid of it. We must phase out the Federal Reserve notes, the Federal Reserve system. And I'm talking now about the United States. All countries in the world face this same problem. We must phase out fiat money. We can't just tolerate it. We can't just say, well, if it's, if it's only 3% or 4%, we could live with that. But people don't stay at 3 or 4%. Historically, political leaders and bankers never stay at 3 or 4% if they can go to 4.5%. And, and they won't stay at 4.5% if they can go to 5 and so forth. So we must get rid of the fiat money system. How do you do that? Well, the first step, of course, the big step, the biggest imaginable step is for people to realize that they even have one. I mean, how many people walking up and down the streets that go into the, uh, the polls each year and elect their leaders, how many people know that we have a fiat money system? How are we going to change that unless we have an understanding, an educational foundation at the electoral level? So this is where we have to start. And then having done that, assuming we have created a, an understanding of the problems and assuming we have created some kind of a political will on the part of the people to bring about reform, then how do you do it? Well, you can't do it all at once. It has to be eased out. We didn't get it all at once. It came to us in little steps over 50, 60, 70 years. That, in my opinion, is how we have to ease out of it. Because if you were to cut the system right now, just completely cut the tree down, we'd have the biggest economic collapse the world has ever seen. So they've got us somewhat, you see. You can't, we're kind of like the, uh, like the drug addict that is so deeply involved that a cold turkey would probably result in death. So I'm sorry to have to say that, but I think that's a realistic appraisal. We must ease out of this system we're in, and we have to start as soon as possible. We have to anticipate that it's going to take probably 30 or 40 years to make it happen. The bankers and the politicians get away with this arrangement, if you want to be kind and call it that, mainly because people don't understand what they're doing. We have been told in our textbooks and by our leaders that what is happening in the, in the banking system is really quite marvelous. We're told that it's a wonderful uh, creation of the, of the new age. 
and that if we didn't have this system, oh yes, there are a few problems here, yes, there are a few inequities, and yes, we got a little inflation, and yes, we admit all these things, but if we didn't have this, we're told, we'd still be living in caves eating raw meat or something like that. So we are given a bill of goods, basically. We are told, don't get too informed on this. Just trust us that we're taking this under advisement and we're doing a good job. And don't rock the boat, whatever you do. You don't want to mess things up, do you? And that, that line usually goes over pretty well and people buy it and they don't, they don't understand it, so they don't want to touch it. It's easy to see where we're headed. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. If you follow a graph and you can see that there are points on this graph and they're going constantly in one direction and they've been doing this for 50 years, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see where it's headed. Where this graph is headed is for total destruction of our monetary system. Our money will be totally worthless and it'll probably be reissued in the form of some international currency which will be equally worthless, but the value to these people is that once it's on an international basis, there's nowhere else to go. Right now, if you, if you don't like American dollars, you can buy uh, Japanese yen. If you don't like that, you can buy uh, Swiss francs. If you don't like that, you can move to whatever currency seems to be having a little better track record. Once there's an international monetary system in place, modeled completely and exactly after the Federal Reserve System, it's exactly the same, then there's no place else to go, folks. You've had it. So that's where it's headed, and if we don't turn this thing around, I think we're going to be living in kind of a, uh, a modern serfdom. And we'll be serving masters, and they won't be living in the big castles uh, that we can see, at least, uh, and say, well, that's where the master lives up there, and we're tilling his field. Um, our masters will be the bankers and the politicians, and they'll live in big houses, but they won't be castles. But we'll be serving masters nevertheless, and we'll be thinking they're wonderful people without realizing that they are our masters. I think we're headed to modern serfdom if we don't turn this around. If the United States went back to constitutional money, it would be an amazingly wonderful event because it wouldn't be just going back to constitutional money. In order for that to happen, that means you'd have to assume a groundswell of awakening on the part of the electorate. And they would understand not only what's happening in the monetary system, but what's happening across the board in our political system. So that, that reform wouldn't happen just by itself. If it happened just by itself, I think we would have a great resurgence of prosperity and uh, tranquility. But unless we get rid of some of these other problems as well, we could still be involved in foreign wars and all kinds of things, uh, forced medication and so many things we could talk about. Those wouldn't be touched just because we went back to a constitutional monetary system. If we went back to constitutional money, uh, there are a lot of things left open as to uh, other aspects to the reform. For example, we could still have horrendous taxes, just be, and we'd be paying it in real money instead of fiat money, but taxes could still be so high because we're still demanding of our politicians that we have all these benefits and all these freebie things and all these uh, um, welfare programs and um, exchange of wealth and movement of wealth from one class to another. We could still be demanding those things if we we're not wise. And so even though we had constitutional money, we would still have tremendous problems in society. So I look at it from a point of view that everything has to happen at once before it to be meaningful, and it has to happen at once before it'll happen at all. But if we did go back to a constitutional monetary system, that means that the electorate would have to be questioning a lot of other things in our society as well. And I think we would see an improvement across the board, and I look forward to that day. Concerned citizens can do a lot to help. First of all, they need to find out the details of this story. Then they need to speak up about it 
and not be intimidated. Not worry too much about someone saying, oh, you're just a worry wart or you're just a conspiracy theorist or something, because a lot of people would like to classify this as a, as a conspiracy, you know. So they have to have a little backbone and say, well, you can call it what you will, but these are the facts and we need reform. Then they need to join forces with other people so that they can have the power to do this. I have created an organization just for that purpose. It's called Freedom Force International. It's based on the assumption that any one person or a small group of people can't do anything, even if we have great knowledge. You have to join forces with other people. And then, having joined forces, you have to have a plan of action. You have to know what to do. It's not enough just to complain about it, or to read another book about it, or to hold a seminar on it, or hold up a placard and demonstrate. Our people are always on the outside of the halls of power, looking in. We're petitioning our leaders, saying, oh, won't you please be good guys? Won't you please follow the Constitution? Won't you please not do this? Won't you please listen to us? And they aren't interested because they have the power, and we don't. And nothing is going to change unless concerned citizens join together with a plan of action to reach out and recapture control of those power centers of society. And by that I'm talking about the political units, talking about all groups and organizations through people through which people work and, and think and form public policy. It's political groups, church organizations, labor unions, you know, uh, civic clubs, uh, everything. We have to be active in all organizations and supply the kind of leadership and direction to replace the leadership and direction that they now have, which is pushing us in the other direction. Unless we have the vision of reaching for this kind of power, then we'll always be on the outside, petitioning and complaining and saying, my goodness, isn't it terrible the way the world is going? So what does a concerned citizen do? He joins forces with others, he has a plan of action, and he comes to power. Such a great author and an amazing book. So, what did you think? Please leave a comment down below and make sure to share this video with anyone else you might think of that wants to end the Fed.